So hopefully you're all feeling calm and ready. Eight days, TikTok. Um, so I'm not going to dwell on um, the boring things here. We're just going to keep it quite focused on a few bits that do come up for finals. So uh, pain assessment, management of acute pain, chronic pain. There's a few calculations to do with chronic pain that do keep coming up. Uh, paracetamol, especially overdose. Um, and then a few other little bits that um, I feel we need to cover before next week. So as you all know, um, pain assessment, probably more than 80% is in the history. Socrates, you're hopefully very good at this now, at taking a pain history. But just make sure you are, because um, you probably all remember it from third year and now have put that at the back of your communication skills. You know how to do a chest pain, abdo pain, but just please do practice it. They do come up and you will have forgotten a few ways of doing things, a few marks that are really easy to get. And the, especially abdo pain, chest pain um, and headache pain uh, do come up in the communication skills, so make sure you're hot on that. Um, now, a few pain assessment tools that people use. Um, it's really important, um, and it's on all of the... So you'll have seen these charts, and they've just added to all of them now that you have a pain score. So they call it the fifth vital sign, um, the respiratory rate, blood pressure, heart rate, SATs, temperature, and then pain score afterwards. So it's really important, to, and it's important to look at it. If they give you an um, OBS chart in the OSCE, and it's got the pain on, and they've written the pain, it will, it's highlighting something that you need to think about. So just make sure you don't ignore it. So the common analgesics that we use, obviously, paracetamol, NSAIDs, and then the opioids, which we'll go through a little bit now. So paracetamol, the most used um, painkiller, the most uh, used uh, thing that w people take overdoses for, and people do present to A&E quite often with paracetamol overdoses of varying degrees. Um, I've done an A&E job, and people come in having taken three paracetamol, saying, I've taken an overdose, ambulance, and they come in, very dramatic. And other people come in at the other end of the, other end of the spectrum. Um, I remember once a doctor came in, and he had taken, um, maybe he'd come to Simply Finals, um, but he'd taken um, about 40 paracetamol, and instead of presenting straight away, he presented eight hours later, so he knew that the NAC wouldn't work. Um, and so he presented 24 hours later, so he knew the NAC would have no um, effect. And he, his presenting complaint was, make me comfortable as I die. Um, so it's really used and it's abused. Um, it's horrible. Um, because people, don't, people expect, he didn't, but others expect to take it as an overdose and then just drift away like they see in the movies. Um, but they don't. They take, it normally takes three or four days for them to die. Um, and it's, a hor it's really not a very nice death for them um, and definitely not for us because there's nothing really after the initial stage that we can do as doctors. So it's, it's important. Paracetamol is a painkiller. There's not much to it, but as an overdose drug, um, we really need to talk about it. Um, so with the um, <coughs> metabolism of uh, paracetamol, there's two different um, pathways that are taken. One, when you're using it at therapeutic doses, um, and its conjugation um, is the main route of metabolism for paracetamol um, in the therapeutic, when you're using it as a therapeutic medication. And oxidation and um, sulfilation which are on the right of the screen, are not that important when you're using it therapeutically. It's mainly conjugation. Whereas in overdose, it's much more on the right-hand side. The conjugation and the um, sulfonation become saturated. And then this, um, the metabolite here that needs to be um, metabolised, it binds to the cellular proteins in the liver, and that's how you lead to the liver damage. So, and, sorry, it's the, glut, uh, where does it say? the glutathione is the supply, um, is the metabolite that's used. So people who do badly after paracetamol overdoses are people who have low doses of the glutathione. And so these are people who are malnourished, cachexic, or chronic alcoholics. And, and so basically people who have poor reserves um, then have more risk of having liver injury because they're not able to metabolise the paracetamol. 
So for this, we'll just do um, a couple of cases. Like I said, I'm not going to dwell too much on this, but quickly. Um, what are this, this person's, what are his risk factors for suicide? So it's age 40 to 44, 40 to 45 is the most common age. He's a male. How many times more likely are we than... Yeah, three or four times more likely. So history of depression. But yeah, and more importantly, his previous suicide attempts. Alcohol. He's got it all, hasn't he? Poor chap. Um, he lives alone. And then a few things about, um, about how he's done it. So he lives alone and he was found by a visitor. So he didn't ring his mum and say, I'm so sad, I'm going to do something stupid and then um, ask or do it just as his mum was going to arrive home. Um, he did it and someone just found him. So it's much more um, concerning as a, a way of taking an overdose. The cry for help is much more, um, normally more obvious to pick out. Um, I'll leave these slides up, but it, there's no, um, it's, it's not rocket science, it's stuff that you've done before about the things that are risk factors for suicide and the things that are protective factors, mainly around support networks um, and some uh, things about the social background of the person and their past medical history or other medical comorbidities. So paracetamol overdose, what's important in the history then? So we've talked about a few things, and you can break it up as you like, but the, in terms of how they've taken the overdose. So the dose is important in terms of us coming on to uh, how we treat it, but you have to take it with a little bit of a pinch of salt. So if you can trust the patient, if there's a collateral history, it gives you a much more um, strong background to use that history. A lot of people, you, uh, are poor historians, will say they've taken one packet when actually the, the family have found 10 packets at home and who you believe, you just need to edge on the side of caution, and we'll come on to where that's important when we're talking about how we treat it. Some people take a staggered overdose, others take one overdose all at once. Um, which is more concerning, or which is harder to treat? Staggered, why? Yeah, so you can't accurately know. So if you take, it's like any drug, you take it once, you know where your starting point is. But if they've staggered both their history of when they've taken things and the way you treat it or what your um, baseline is, it's much more difficult. Symptoms. What symptoms do most people with paracetamol overdose present with? Abdo pain. Abdo pain. No yeah, no, nausea, but no symptoms. So most people have no symptoms at all. And people who present with symptoms, nausea, um, abdominal pain, especially if they have right upper quadrant pain um, and they present with paracetamol overdose, is a really bad prognostic factor. And then the psychiatric background that we've talked about. Past medical history, we've touched on, um, so history of previous suicide attempts is the biggest risk factor. And then enzyme inducing drugs will just alter the way that the drug is metabolized. So that's important in terms of what other drugs or medications they're using. So, how do we treat a paracetamol overdose? So it depends how long. So give the two options. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. So the two, if you can, if people present quickly, you can use activated charcoal, but often they aren't presenting quick enough. So um, then NAC is the antidote or the medication we use. So then in terms of the the thought process in terms of how to use it. One is, do they need it? And two is, what dose? So we're just going to move on. Um, and these five cases, do they need treating or do they not need treating? So you've all seen, I hope, this, uh, this graph. So it's just got one line on now, the, therapy, the treatment line. So just go through these five cases. Okay, so the first one, would we treat it or would we not treat it? Treat it. 
treat? Anyone not treat? No? Brilliant. So, so the first one we treat, so it's above the line here. Anyone who's just being quiet because they weren't sure. So you plot the concentration in the blood with the hours after the overdose that's taken. And you can see now why a staggered overdose is much more difficult. The next one, would we treat? No, maybe. So hands up for no. Hands up for yes. There's no maybe. Any maybes? Not allowed to be a maybe. No. Um, so no. So be confident. So it's not. It's if it's above or below the line. So this is below the line. So you don't treat it. If you're sure of a history and these are the results, then you don't treat it. <coughs> the next one. So we've got a treat. Any any not treats. Any treats. It's a lot of maybes then. Um, so this is on the line. So on the line we treat. I don't know why there's two dots there. I oh, know that's the second one. So this one here is on the line, so we treat it. And you see here, the amount doesn't matter in terms... And I think it's... I don't know the logic behind it, but I think it makes sense that it doesn't matter because the histories are so often um, poor and difficult to interpret how many they've taken. It's much, these are accurate results. So if it's on the line, though, you edge on the size of caution. Not using it can have dire effects. Using it, if you shouldn't use it, will only give them nausea um, or some vague pains, but not really anything of um, too much. What would you do about case four? Treat. Anyone not treat? Anyone wait? So when can you do this blood test? After four hours. So anyone, so we try again. So anyone treat? Yeah. Anyone not treat? Or anyone wait? Good. Excellent. So treat. So basically if you don't wait for the four hours, it's just if it is, you can only interpret the blood test after four hours. This is a significant history, taking 50 paracetamol tablets. So you just treat, and then you can do the blood test later if you want to, but you treat straight away. And then case five. So treat, not treat, or wait for four hours. Yeah, so you'd still wait, do the, wait for four hours, and then do the... But you wouldn't treat them straight away. So everyone happy with this graph and how to interpret it? Um, it does come up. So then the dose of the treatment. So you, won't, you don't need to remember the dose, um, but the dose is... Um, 300 milligrams per kilogram over 20 hours, and it's into this um, over using this algorithm, which you don't need to remember the dose, but you do need to use the um, be able to prescribe the drug and use this algorithm. So this is an we've got a 50 kilo patient using this algorithm. What doses of the um, NAC would you use, and what rates would you run them over? Okay, anyone want to take a start? So what, what, how would you dose this patient? So 750? 7,500. So yeah, so 7.5 grams. So it's not difficult here. So you're just times 150 by 50 to get this part. And it's in 200 mils of glucose and it's run over 15 minutes. So the next part, so the, the next part of a regime. Yeah, good. 2.5 grams. And then the last part, 5 grams. So what's the rate in mils per hour for this
So what's the rate, anyone? We've got 800 mils per hour. Anyone? Anything else on that? Any other ideas? Happy with 800 or not happy with 800? Happy, yeah? So 200 mils in 15 minutes, so 200 mils in quarter of an hour. So you're timesing that by four, so 800 mils an hour. But you're right to think that seems a, a ridiculous amount, a high rate. So you should check it and check it again, but it is right. The rate for the next one? So 125, and then the last one you need a calculator maybe, so that's 62. Um, just make sure you know how to prescribe things like this, because they're <laughs> going to ask you to do that. Um, so I'll just quickly show you here. So um, if you look on the top here, and uh, zoom in a bit. <coughs> So just make sure you're happy with these. So it's easy when you're prescribing fluids because you're just prescribing something with nothing in it. But when you're prescribing something like this, the solution that you're putting it in goes in this. So the glucose that you're putting it in goes in this <coughs> column here. And then the additives, which is the medication, goes in here. Volume and then the rate. And rate. This is easy. But just make sure you're happy with these two. So what's wrong with this, this prescription here? Doesn't say how much knack, good. Well, so many. One at a time. So I think I had abbreviation, so you can't use knack, but I couldn't be bothered to spell it out. Say again? Excellent. So the glucose concentration. So the same with knack, what dose is that? You need to know what concentration the glucose is. The rate. So what's wrong with that? So no, again, missing units, so 800 mils per hour. And there's two more. No yeah, okay, it doesn't even ask for it. Terrible. But yeah, you should put your bleep here. No, volume's all right. And the date, so you need to put which year it's in. So these are nearly perfect afterwards, but just the abbreviation I didn't put here. So be happy with that. Make sure you can just Google drug chart and they'll have this. Make sure you're happy. Maybe practice next weekend, not this weekend. So for your OSCEs um, or the practical skills one, they'll definitely or can ask you to do that. Um, okay. So in extreme circumstances, um, people need a liver transplant or having taken a paracetamol overdose. And it's basically failure of certain... No, System. So the liver, the kidney, um, your clotting, um, if you have metabolic acidosis or a very raised lactate after fluid resuscitation, then these are possible criteria. But basically you call them if you're worried and they'll give you up-to-date criteria. So NSAIDs, um, you will know mostly about them. Just quickly, if, um, if you risk stratify someone as being high risk of having gastric irritation, what can you do? PPI with it, yeah. Or? Give it with food. Yeah, so you always give it with food or after food. Anything else? Any alternatives? So COX-2 inhibitor um, have lower gastric side effects. Um, and then, yeah, as you know, you, you shouldn't use it with asthmatics or people with kidney failure. So opioids, I'm going to you know the side effects, you all know naloxone, and you need to make use, use it multiple times. Um, I just want to get to the last bit. Um, the other opioids, again, you don't really need to know much more than that they are there. They have the same side effects, just weaker than, the, than morphine. PCA, um, I'm not going to dwell on. So then palliative care. So... Um, Palliative care drugs are really important in the last days and weeks of someone's life are the, probably the most important um, for the family as well as the patient. Um, the palliative care team are amazing and they cover all aspects of um, someone's well-being or their quality of life at this late stage. So the GI symptoms, the nausea, vomiting, obviously important. 
what medication can use for um, increased secretions. Yeah, good. So glycopyrrolate um, for anxiety or agitation. Yeah, so a benzo usually we use midazolam. And then for pain symptoms, there is this pain ladder uh, which you, um, you can use, but in the later stages of um, people's disease, it, you usually use um, opioids, so uh, morphine or fentanyl patches. So we're just going to race through this now. So a palliative patient is needing morphine. Um, first time they've been using non-morphine or non-opioid analgesia before it. So what dose would you use? What would you prescribe the patient with morphine? So five mils of oromorphine. So what dose is that normally? So, it's, it, so it, yeah, so you need to use the milligrams rather than the milliliters. There's different concentrations. Usually it's uh, double the concentration, but just use the milligrams. So five milligrams of morphine or oromorph. Any advances on that? How often would you give that? Five to ten every four hours if needed. Five to ten every four hours if needed. What do we think about that? So it can be quite high, but equally they can need more than that. So um, what's the maximum dose you could give someone? Okay, so yeah, there's not really a maximum, but to start with. Um, so five to ten every four hours is, I think, a reasonable starting dose. But then, so this is regular. Um, and then you need to make sure they've got a breakthrough or PRN dose as well. So they, you've given her ten milligrams to start with, and the pain's still not relieved. So um, you, the next time she's going to need it is four hours later. So how would you then change the prescription? So you give the PRN one, but you're going to need to change your prescription because she's getting to beyond four hours and still she's needing something in between. So what would you give 10 the next time and make her wait? Or how much would you increase it to? So 15 looked like a pluck out of air, but it was a very good pluck. So yeah, so you increase the dose by 50%. So the next time you're prescribing it, you give 15 milligrams every four hours rather than the 10 and keeping the PRN dose. So, this, so that, that bit's relative. You can play around with that, but this is important. So over 24 hours, um, our patient has used her morphine sulfate, a few, her regular dose, and she's also used her breakthrough dose. So how would you now change, or would you change her medication dose now? Yeah, so we now need to use a slow-release morphine. So you, so you add up their 24-hour requirement, so it's 120, and you give it as two slow-release. So you give MST, morphine sulfate, slow-release, 60 BD is probably the best, and then breakthrough. And what dose of breakthrough? So a sixth of the total, so it's 20 milligrams. That will make sense. So the numbers you need to remember are, so you need to add them up and split them in two to make a breakthrough, um, and so to make a slow release, and then a sixth of the total daily dose is their breakthrough dose. No difference between spinal and epidural. I'm not going to go through it now because of time. Antiemetics, these slides, I think you just need to know this much about antiemetics. The most common one, cyclozine, ondansetron, metoclopramide. Nothing more than that, and same with laxatives. So just please read these. Um, it'll take you five minutes. Um, I've put a few calculations here, um, which you can do in your own time. So I want to get on to um, Dr. Feather. So you need to know about adrenaline doses, what the percentage means. Urine output's really important, and all the workings are there. Um, what percentage um, in terms of burns the patient is, is a quick and easy um, EMQ question for them to ask you. Good luck. So you've got um, seven days. Enjoy yourself. Smile. Take your time. Read the question. And 
just try and enjoy it a little bit because you will afterwards. Thank you.